I'm going to talk uh, today about Waze, which is why I always talk about it at RubyConf. Uh, Waze started out life as an attempt to sort of get outside the MVC box and experiment with, uh, instead of an application framework, kind of more of an architectural framework. And so it sort of evolved. Uh, some of you who were in some of the initial LA Ruby group meetings may remember I gave kind of a brief overview last summer. We had just come out of this sort of deep, dark cavern of refactoring, and uh, it was sort of the first tentative things of saying, okay, here's kind of what we've come up with, uh, you know, after you know, a round of you know, doing a release, getting feedback, doing some refactoring. And the exciting part for me is that, uh, you know, we've actually made a fair amount of progress. It seems like the, the, the foundation for Waves has gotten pretty solid. I gave a talk at, uh, at uh, the Orlando, you know, the National Ruby Comp on Waves, and uh, we haven't had any, you know, major restarts or rethinks since then. So I'm not going to go over that same content in this talk. I'm going to focus a little bit more on some questions that I've been answering about Waves uh, quite often. That talk, thanks again to Kobe, is on uh, the Concrete's website. So. Rather than rehash that, if you want to see that talk, you can go to Confreaks and see it, uh, if this talk intrigues you. In this talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on a uh, question that I get a lot. And there's sort of a Socratic dialogue that seems to be accompanying waves as it evolves. And it started off with, well, why wouldn't I just use Rails? Uh, and the answer to that was, well, you know, this is trying to go, this is if you're, if your apps, uh, if you find yourself kind of painting outside the MVC lines, you know, then maybe Waves is something you might want to look at because it, it's trying to help you and then you have to go do something a little bit unconventional. So then people would say, well, you know, isn't that kind of what RAP does? It's, you know, it's an architectural framework uh, for dealing with, uh, you know, web applications. And, and there's a lot of synergy between RAP and Waves, but the thing that, that uh, RAP does, or the Waves does, is it adds a lot of support for things uh, over and above just the basics of handling an HTTP request that you typically find in frameworks. In fact, there's an MVC layer that's in Waves that sort of demonstrates some of the richness of, of Waves. <clears throat> so then the next question is, okay, I get that. It's kind of, you know, a layer on top of RAP, really, uh, for defining application frameworks. Um, and, and then we kind of got into this whole uh, resource-oriented kick of saying, well, you know, the next thing beyond MVC uh, that makes sense is to sort of help developers write more REST compliant applications. And uh, that, you know, there's some support for doing that in MVC frameworks, but MVC frameworks by their nature sort of try to encapsulate a lot of what HTTP is really doing under the covers, and so it's a little difficult sometimes to, to access all of it. I mean, it's doable, but it's not natural. So then the question came up, and I really felt good about that answer, but then the questions kept coming, well, well, why do I really need REST? What, you know, if the things that I'm doing go beyond what I find in the MVC frameworks and those frameworks are working really well for me, then what do I need, you know, to, to have, to, to just because there's, you know, these sort of, uh, these constraints in REST, you know, aren't they a little arbitrary? Or do they really, are they really going to buy anything? So I'm going to try to address that, that question uh, in this talk and kind of talk a little bit about how waves Hopefully, if time allows, I can get into sort of some of the specifics about how Waves addresses that. But I'd like to talk kind of the larger picture of what of what uh, that buys you. Before I go into that, let me just say I'm the director of development and R&D at at and Interactive. I've been doing software development for about 20 years, working with Ruby. Um, like a lot of people, I came to it uh, in 2005 with the emergence of Rails. <coughs> Uh, Waves is about a year old. I've done a number of gems, mostly spin-outs from Waves. Uh, our group at at and Interactive has uh, released some apps, including a kind of an amusing one that's a restroom locator called Half the Key for your iPhone. Uh, and there's some other nice little search utilities that go along with that, Half to Eat, Half to Drink. And we released also one of the first voice search applications. And all of these on the back end are actually powered by Waves. So, that gives you a little idea, hopefully, of where I'm coming from. <clears throat> I think to understand resource-oriented architecture and, and why we're trying to focus on it so much with uh, with Waves, 
Uh, it's really useful to start off with an easy to overlook fact about the web, which is that it really is arguably the most successful and discriminating computing architecture ever. And, uh, you know, to put that into more concrete terms, we know it scales. There's millions and millions of clients, millions and millions of servers. There are different types, right? We have uh, different types of web browsers, different types of web servers. We even have different categories of clients, RSS readers versus web browsers. Uh, we have this sort of emerging uh, domain of things like Adobe Air applications, which are often actually HTTP-based, uh, going talking to a backend. It's based on open standards, which is something that, of course, for Ruby developers is near and dear to our heart. It's an open platform. It's not dependent or controlled by a single vendor. So it's a distributed computing platform. Unlike a lot of previous ones, it's not essentially, say, like Corba. Uh, it's not, you know, in, in, there's some politics associated with it, but the standards are so broad and there's so many different stakeholders that it seems to have gone beyond the old politicking uh, and sort of profiteering strategies that used to handicap distributed computing platforms. The other thing that's really interesting about the web is the infrastructure that it provides. We have a lot of proxies and load balancers and all this stuff, and it's already all out there, and it allows us to factor a lot of logic that would normally have to be, uh, that we have to deal with in our own applications out into the network, so the network starts to become more and more intelligent. And what's really cool about this is uh, that we can then leverage all of this infrastructure if we're building new types of, uh, new types of clients or new types of servers you know, so the next time, I've, I've had uh, conversations in the past quite often where, you know, there's a need for some reason for some kind of application-specific protocol, and, you know, the tendency is to say, oh, we'll just bang it out in TCP IP, you know, or UDP or something simple, and let's not make it too complicated. We don't really need HTTP. But if what you're doing is going to have any life beyond the, uh, the sort of immediate application of it, uh, there's all this infrastructure that, that you can sort of piggyback on to get things like load balancing for scaling and so on. But the thing is, this is all kind of secondary things. These are all the things that we know about the web. Well, what we don't really know, or at least I'm going to assert that it's an area of some confusion. Uh, some of you may feel like you know this, so I don't, I, you know, I shouldn't say. I, I have started with it, I guess is what I should say is why, why does this really all work so well? And I think that the heart of this thing is the constraints of REST architecture. I don't think it's a coincidence that that's Fielding's dissertation and his name is at the top of the list of authors of HTTP specification, right? So if we, if we can understand what REST is really trying to do and what these constraints are really talking about and then begin to apply them, to what we're doing in web applications, uh, hopefully we'll get the same, we'll have the same emerging characteristics that the web has, right? Now you'd think that uh, because the web is so successful and all the things I just talked about, that this might have already happened. So anytime you sort of have this idea about, well, hey, let's do this, you know, it's often wise to kind of ask yourself, well, why hasn't, there's lots of smart people out there, why hasn't it already been done? And I think what we've been doing, and the reason that MVC is so successful today, is what we've been doing is we've been essentially piggybacking off the web browsers, right? We're stuffing our applications into an existing web application called the browser. Now, the browser takes care of a lot of stuff for us. It takes care of content negotiation, for example. It takes care of caching. A lot of the things that REST is talking about, the browsers are implementing, sometimes not so well, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that you find people wanting to bust out of the browser or we talk about rich internet applications and there's sort of this ongoing debate as to whether or not they belong in the browser at all or if you need something like Adobe Air that allows you to just bypass the constraints and decisions that the browser makers are making for us. A couple of examples here real quick of, of cases where we see uh, the benefits of, of busting out of the browser, right? RSS feeds, they, there's some 
you know, resource, the, the whole RDF idea there is, is, is embedded in the notion of, um, of uh, a, a feed, right? It describes, instead of me having to go figure out how to scrape every individual blog, I just have a little thing that describes how I'm supposed to get to that blog, providing some metadata for me. It's content neutral, so we end up with this sort of unanticipated benefit down the road of, of, of podcasting, right? That, can, that comes out of the fact that the client, uh, that RSS and the idea of RSS clients were built around at least some of the principles and constraints of REST architecture. Another example, this is a little bit more, I haven't actually seen any of this, uh, something like this implemented, but this is an example of something that you could do. How many people are familiar or have begun playing around with, uh, with uh, OAuth? <coughs> So, so OAuth is a is a, uh, a, a sort of a what are you guys uh, chuckling about? That's a really thing we're working on right now. Oh, that's kind of <laughs> I should have realized that because I, I actually told you. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it's essentially a, uh, a a kind of a workflow or, or process for. Uh, you know, two sites cooperating and share information. So one site uh, basically uh, can ask permission from another site uh, to, to access certain information and the user can kind of grant that permission. Now, if you were to use the, the strategy that we see all over the place in web architecture for uh, dealing with documents, what we could do is we could actually implement this as a smart proxy that knows how to deal with OAuth and now, by just simply implementing a login page and a permission granting page on our, on our web app, you know, we get OAuth across the board for all of our apps, you know, without having to do it one at a time. Another example uh, is the use of edge caching. If you have a really compute intensive uh, uh, server activity, it doesn't really buy you a whole lot to put the uh, uh, to try to, to, you know, obviously you need to use caching in a situation like that, but, but even more importantly, you want to actually push the cache all the way out to the edge, as close to the client as you can. And that's another property of web architectures. So taking a, taking a step back, the question that, um, you know, that, that we were trying to answer is, is why does this really work? And, and you know why do these different architectures? I mean, we, so, so there's some examples of cool things you can do by following those principles, and but we're still not getting at what is really going on here. And what I'm going to submit to you is that what REST constraints describe are sort of the necessary constraints for a a distributed object system. Okay, and and. I'm not sure, you know, if, if Roy Fielding is here, he might start throwing rotten tomatoes at this point. This is my own speculation on this, but this has helped me kind of understand it. So it's sort of in a, in a coarse grain sense. If you say resource equals object, you're sort of halfway there to understanding why this really works underneath the cover. So this, of course, is it's not a new problem, right? We've seen, we've seen this many times before. Uh, through RPC and RMI and Corva, uh, you know, and, and all of these attempts never really took off, and yet the web is just phenomenally successful, relatively speaking. And uh, the reason is, is that uh, I believe that the people that were involved in developing the HTTP specification were obviously very well aware of the past history of a lot of these attempts to create distributed computing platforms. And they learn from the past mistakes. So the first thing that they learned is, you know what? Don't pin down the platforms. Don't try to come up with a format for marshalling objects and fix it. Because there's too many cases where either technology evolves in new formats that are more appropriate for some applications uh, become available, or you know, we have the case where you know, the, uh, the formats you know, are just they're not new necessarily, but they may be a little surprising for some applications. So for example, if you're, if you're trying to access a movie object, uh, if you want to play, if the client is trying to play the movie, it just wants the movie itself, right? The QuickTime file or whatever. If it's trying to display you know, information about the movie, maybe it wants a JSON file that describes the, the movie. And uh, so I don't want to prescribe or dictate 
how how that uh, what, you know what format uh, the, the so that's the separation in, in rest between a resource and a representation, right? I don't want to dictate the format. I want the client to tell me what it'll continue, it's looking for. I want to be wire neutral. This is something that's really interesting to me about REST is the fact that it actually says, look, I'm not even sure what the protocol is going to be. And you see this with the evolution. You know, we use HTTP a lot, but we see that, you know, okay, now we needed security, so we went to HTTPS. And the future, who knows what it'll hold. Maybe if I want to, if the, if the resource, if I want to mail to a resource, or if I want to, FTP something, I can use those protocols. So I just say, you know, what protocol this uh, resource is going to understand or is most appropriate for what I'm trying to do, and I use that in the, in the URL. Another thing we've learned is you have to have very consistent meta object protocols so that you can do all the things that you see in HTTP with get, post, click, delete. I mean, you need a simple set of verbs that works everywhere. And if you don't, and that's the whole thing about uniform stateless interfaces. If you don't have that, then you start coupling the client and server together on a case-by-case -case basis. The more generic it is, you know, sometimes it's less efficient, but in the end you end up benefiting because it's far more scalable and flexible. And that's where you get these, this emergent property of, of uh, web architecture. Performance, obviously, if you're going to start moving objects over the wire, one of the big objections that held up a lot of transition over to messaging-based architectures was the fact that, hey, I don't really want to move the whole, what if I don't need the whole object? We're not as bandwidth constrained today as we were then, so it's a little bit more feasible, but we still worry about performance. So you still need to have, you know, edge caching, you still need to be able to move code over to the client. So again, that's one of the principles of REST is, you know, being able to move client over. Layered architectures is another issue. This is the whole thing of having things like smart proxies. So, in, uh, in, even in the service-oriented architecture world, you see this. You know, the idea is you make an intelligent network or a network fabric or something that has a lot of the intelligence for things like security policies, uh, you know, delivery policies, and so on. And you can bake those right into the fabric of the network instead of burdening each of the applications or APIs with them. So, that's, that's kind of the, the big picture. Now, what, again, the premise here for Waves is that more and more we're going to want to bust out of the web browser, or even when we're, when we're in the web browser, we're going to want to try to take control more and more of the communication between the client and the server. And the goal of Waves is to try to help you do that. So I'm going to try to talk, I don't know, does anybody have the time? I don't know. I should. You got the time. Ten minutes? Okay, that should be about right. So I'm going to try to go over a few of the ways, that, uh, just a few highlights of ways and, and how it kind of connects to this whole uh, idea of resource-oriented architecture. So the first thing is that, and this is where we did a lot of refactoring over the summer and came out with this. The first thing is this idea of having a DSL that allows you to naturally talk about the entire HTTP request and isn't URL-centric. What is DSL? A domain-specific language. So, you know, like uh, probably one of the most famous DSLs is Active Records DSL for things like, you know, has many and, um, and, and so on. So, uh, Waves has a DSL for dealing with the HTTP request. You see an example here, and what this example does is allow me to have, uh, to, to trigger a, uh, a piece of code based on what query parameters were included, whether they satisfy a particular format, uh, and uh, you know, what the accept format is that the client is asking for. So, you know, I know that uh, these are the formats I know how to handle, so I don't really want to commit to anything else. So this is kind of a, uh, you know, there's nothing terribly sophisticated here, it's just that it goes a little bit beyond what you see in a lot of frameworks that are very focused around the, the URI or the URL. And you can match on pretty much anything in a request. Uh, We've had some fun kind of experimenting and enriching this in some of the, the apps that we've been building at at and Interactive. But underneath the covers, one of the key points, and this we got to go into more detail in the Orlando presentation, but uh, it's on concrete. Uh, but but the, underneath the covers, we're still just talking about resources, uh, methods on a resource, or methods on a resource instance. And those are just the things that you expect, get, put, post, and delete. So here's a this is just a little fragment of code demonstrating the fact that 
Uh, they're really just normal Ruby methods. The DSL is just helping you define those methods and handling all of the matching code and stuff that you would normally have to write. Uh, there, in Waves, the resources are just, they're just classes, so all the normal things that you can do with Ruby apply. Now this, uh, this was inspired actually by Blake's uh, Sinatra uh, framework. I, I wanted to see if I could actually come up with something that was remotely similar to what uh, Sinatra was doing in terms of being able to have a simple, small application and, and sort of start with a really simple, compact stub and be able to build up from there. So this is just kind of a, an example of uh, you know, the simplest possible hello world that could, that could work. It's not quite as concise as Sinatra, but uh, it's about as close as we could come with the approach that we had. Uh, now, in terms of where we're going, so that was kind of, all that stuff is there and working. We recently implemented uh, HTTP caching. Uh, Roberto actually implemented that thanks to Rack Cache. Um, and, you know, that's kind of interesting because that's that whole thing of being able to now push the cache out to the edge of the network rather than having it on the same server or even on the same uh, cluster of servers locally. I start, I just tell HTT, I tell the network, hey, this is my caching policy for this data. Uh, but where we want to go is we want to actually uh, start to get more of a true REST DSL, not just a DSL for matching the request, but a DSL for describing the resources. So this is an example of how that might look. Now this is still under development, and uh, if you jump onto the Google group for Ruby Waves, which is called Ruby Waves, um, you know you can uh, actually uh, jump in on this discussion if you have ideas about how this might look or work, and uh, that would be very welcome because it's uh, we're still kind of trying to figure it out. But the idea here, if you just sort of follow along with the logic here, is that I can describe a. Uh, uh, a number of resources as a part of a resource server. So I say, okay, here's my, here's my component, it's a server component, and uh, these are the resources that it knows about, and these are the schemas. And you'll notice we're defining them independent of the representations, which is again sort of a key precept of, of a REST-based architecture, is the separation between uh, the resource and the representation. So at the bottom there, uh, I have uh, you know the, rep the representations that I know how to deal with, and I can define those. And it's very dry that way, right? I, I can define as many representations and as many resources, uh, and uh, that as I as I need to. Uh, but uh, I don't end up with sort of redundant cases uh, or redundant code, sort of declaring you know every possible combination. And uh, in there you also see the scheme element. And the idea here is that we could automatically generate RDF to describe a service endpoint using RDF, which allows for sort of machine introspection of service and actually dynamic, possibly dynamic composition, uh, you know, which is a little bit out there, but you know, that's kind of the principle behind the success of RSS. Is I have a description of the, of the blog object, right, or the podcast object. And that's kind of how I think about it, is we're in this world where there was a document object, and then we sort of stuffed applications in there, sort of tunneled applications through these document objects, but now we're kind of getting more and more into different types of objects, blogs, uh, podcasts, and uh, you know, it's starting to become important potentially to even have application-specific type of objects. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I have a, a, you know, a, a car, mind type that describes cars. So now I can sort of have a client say, I need this version of the mind type uh, for cars. There we go. So we have yeah. the obligatory <coughs> surfing bikini girl of all ways presentations. Always wrap up with a picture of a, of a bikini girl surfing. Um, just sort of. Is it the girl each time or no? <laughs> You know, and that's an interesting that you asked that question. Uh, <laughs> I spent a, a uh, embarrassingly long amount of time trying to find a picture to follow up this one. It's the same one as before. Um, it's actually surprisingly hard to find. Like I'm almost thinking I'm going to make this part of the waves. Job is to go out and take these photos. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a rough job, but you know. Somebody's got to do it. 
Okay. Some of the vital stats, the website, uh, the Google groups, we'd love to see people on there and, and get some feedback. It's, uh, you know, this is not a solved problem. You know, we're not trying to say we understand it fully. So if you have ideas or insights into, you know, how to map uh, resource-oriented architecture and REST computing into, um, you know, a, a Ruby framework, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, some acknowledgments, some of the folks, just real quick, I wanted to mention uh, Roberto, who's Polymar, uh, Errol Sinatari, who uh, uh, mostly works on Rubinius, but has done some work also with, uh, with Waves, Pete Elmore, KK, Matthew King, uh, and a lot of other folks have done a lot of great work over the past six months on, on Waves, and hopefully that list will get longer with some of you also jumping in and contributing. So, thank you.